So hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Trial Talk Live. I'm Julianne Labreche. Waiting in the wings is Pentka Mataska, another master gardener who's going to help to coordinate any questions that you'll have when the talk is over. And just a reminder to put any of those questions in the chat room. So um, today's speaker is Kelly Knoll. Uh, Kelly told me earlier that today she's going to try to convince you to be just as happy to see a caterpillar in your garden as you are to see a butterfly. You don't have to convince me of that. Kelly, over to you. Thank you, Julianne. This is the message today. If you love the butterfly, then you have to love the caterpillar because this is a circle. I discovered after I said I would, uh, I thought up the topic for this talk and then said, okay, I will do that. When the time comes, I realized I knew hardly anything. I knew about the monarch. Everybody knows it quite a bit about the monarch. I knew what it's butter, what it uh, looked like. I knew what the caterpillar looked like. I knew that it had to feed on uh, milkweed. And I knew that the butterflies that were born in the fall were like super monarchs and they flew all the way to Mexico where they, uh, congregate in in hibernation and in exhaustion i would expect and then in the spring they start back again but of course the trip back is multi-generation generational that's all i knew so i had to get studying and i i went down a bit of a rabbit hole i have to say i I just found weird caterpillar after weird caterpillar after weird caterpillar. And, and I'm gonna show you some four, I think, or maybe five of those before I get on to the ones that I decided I should tell you more about this. You would actually see this, uh, the swallowtail butterfly here, but the caterpillar tends to, to feed high up in the trees. So it, you're less likely to run into it. And these are not, uh, these are just decorations on its head that look like eyes, but apparently it's quite effective in, in uh, diverting uh, uh, predators from it. And this one, I mean, this is crazy. The, the deck, <laughs> it's a moth. So but we, you would see it here in Ontario, both the moth and the caterpillar, and it does sting. Those are not sting in the sense of pierce you with something, but those protuberances would sting you if you pick this thing up. But I'm not sure I would ever pick it up. And then this one, this is huge. It's 11 centimeters long when it is mature. And what on earth are these little protuberances for here? Some are yellow with black hair, some are blue. Like, who, who designed these? It's just crazy. Now this one I picked because it is looks like a, a monarch. A lot of people are fooled by these. You will see these here. The, the thing that gives it away is this ring uh, marking around the, uh, the hind wings. And it does not feed on, um, uh, the larvae does not feed on the milkweed. It feeds on willow, poplar, aspen, trees like that. And this is what the caterpillar looks like. It looks like bird droppings. But uh, you, you could conceivably see that here in, an, in Ontario. And then I picked, this is the last one. I picked this because this caterpillar looks like a monarch caterpillar and you would you wouldn't see this here you if you were uh, traveling in the south in a warm area you would you might see this caterpillar and it feeds on milkweed so you might be fooled into thinking that that is a monarch but it's the queen butterfly anyway that's the end of my rabbit hole now i'm going to tell you about some um caterpillars and butterflies you should expect to see here so this is the first one, it's the morning cloak. And this is the first one to appear in the spring. And in the early spring, as soon as the temperature warms up to about 15 degrees, these guys appear, maybe looking a little beat up because they're about 10 months old at that point. And they, in the fall, they find a crevice, uh, some protected place to creep in and they overwinter there as adults. This is what the uh, 
the ventral side of the wings looks like. Butterflies are one of the things that distinguishes them from moths, I have learned, is that butterflies can fold their wings, whereas moth wings always are open. So uh, you always should be aware of what the ventral side of the wings look like as well as the dorsal side because in many cases they're quite different. There's not much difference between a male and a female morning cloak but here's a, a strange thing that it does. This is not typical behavior. When these tired butterflies crawl out of their hibernation spots in the spring already about 10 months old that's when they mate and lay their eggs. Now these eggs are probably uh, several days old because they're quite white when they're first laid. And they this is very typical that they lay them in neat rows around the tip of a um, uh, host plant, like a willow, birch, elm. And the caterpillars also, of course, hatch en masse. And this apparently is uh, also um, a way of defense that there are so many of them and they cluster together a lot of other caterpillars are solitary but not these guys and this is what the uh, chrysalis looks like you would uh, look for this in um, July and that's when the uh, butterfly will emerge and they are on the wing for the, the next few months in July August September October probably not mating, just feeding, waiting for winter to come so they can crawl in and hide somewhere and overwinter as um, an adult. They don't have to go to Mexico to do that. This is why they're one of the first ones you see in the spring, because they start creeping out as soon as it warms up. And if you have an unseasonably warm time, they can come out with snow still on the ground. Now, this is the second one I picked. This is the White Admiral, and this only has one generation each year here, and the butterflies hatch around the middle of July, so uh, they should still be on the wing now. They don't last all that long. They're very graceful flyers. They have an unusual pattern. They, they, they flap a bit, and then they glide, and then they flap a bit, and then they glide. This has a, it's a wingspan is about eight and a half centimeters. So it's fairly small. The uh, monarch is a, pr a probably around 10 centimeters. And m most people know the size of a monarch. A lot of these butterflies are smaller. This is what the ventral side looks like. It, quite different. Let me go back there. This, this is the dorsal side. This is the ventral side. And, and clearly they are quite different. Now, this is what they do. They um, lay the eggs on aspens, willows, and often uh, birch trees here in, in the more Northern regions, often low to the ground. So you might find them there. And then what happens is the little egg hatches and then it maybe goes through two stages. Most caterpillars go through five molting stages some six. Now this one, after maybe the second stage, it hides for the winter. It folds itself up in a leaf. It spins a little silk to attach that leaf more firmly to the tree. And then it hides itself in there for the winter. Now this little guy has emerged. This was taken in May. This guy has emerged this is its place where it was sequestered during the winter. This is called a hibernaculum. It's just an, a leaf. One of the ways that they say you can determine one of these is that if you see a dead leaf hanging off one of these trees, especially near, near the ground where you can actually see it, if it is just a dead leaf that's still hanging on there, it won't move if you uh, give it some air to move it. If it's one of these hanging by a thread and you um, swish the air around it, it will actually move because it's hanging by this special silk. So this is what the caterpillar actually looks like by the time it is fully grown <laughs> and pretty ugly. Looks like bird dropping, so they say. And this is what the chrysalis looks like. So these actually overwinter here 
as little tiny caterpillars hiding rolled up in a leaf in a state of torpor, diapause, hibernation, several different words for the same thing. And then this is the next one. This is called the Red Admiral. It used to be apparently Red Admirable. And same with the White Admiral, but over the time it just got dropped down to uh, Admiral. And um, these are quite small. These are only about six centimeters wingspan. And I told you that the monarch is about 10. So um, these fly back up to Ontario in the spring when the weather warms up. They do have a migration, not nearly as dramatic as the monarch, but they do migrate up toward the north as uh, when spring comes. This is what the uh, underside of the wings looks like, quite different. Now, the males tend to fly very erratically, and they look like they're defending their territory. The females fly with purpose. They are looking for their host plant to lay their eggs. Now, their host plant is stinging nettle or any of the nettle. There's um, 50 different genera that are in that family, and they can use all of them. This is a much enlarged egg, and a lot of them have this look. And you can see this one is they are laid in uh, singly now the female can lay several on the same plant but they, she, she doesn't lay them in rows like the earlier one did and these are the caterpillars on stinging nettles you should theoretically be able to see these because every garden usually has some nettles trying to get in there and um, so you may see these and this is what the chrysalis looks like there's now uh, two generations in the north, the uh, the last butterflies to uh, hatch, the ones as the fall approaches, they either fly south as far as South Carolina, or maybe even as far as Texas, or they die. They If they stay in the north, they will not survive. And apparently, there's a much less notable migration south in the fall compared to the migration north in the spring. I don't know why, but that's the way it is. Now, this, this, I've had personal experience with this guy. This is a black swallowtail. This one is a, a male. This is the female, and the female has more blue. And um, this is what the underside of the wings looks like, and you see the spotty body. Now, this is the, um, caterpillar that I found some years ago and I was horrified to see this big thing on my dill and I hastily removed it and I didn't take care where I put it. Now I know that had I put it on Queen Anne's lace I would have maybe been doing it a favor but I had a new experience a couple of years ago with this um, these caterpillars. I had on my patio which was is cement patio with a wall around it uh, a pot a big pot that had various herbs in it and I went out one day and I this was my parsley and it was completely gone and you can see all the company that I have here and uh, I realized right away that this was the black swallowtail of old that I had so unceremoniously disrespected some years ago I had the tiny little just hatched eggs that you can see this they're black with this little white band and very quickly they start looking like this and with the green and yellow and black. They're also called a parsley worm and so what I did that day because they had totally eaten every bit of parsley that was there I rushed out to the grocery store and I bought a, a little bunch of parsley and I came home and the the three or four big ones had escaped by that time I found them I mean where can they go on a, a cement patio with a wall I found them I got them in a box with the uh, parsley and I took them out into the garden where theoretically they could actually maybe go somewhere and pupate I think maybe one of them survived this this traumatic experience I barely survived. This is what the um, 
pupil stage looks like. And I just am really quite fascinated by this sling that they weave for themselves. And they hang on to the um, whatever stem it is like that. They, uh, they will appear in June. That's when they come out. And um, I'm hoping, and they are around for a bit of time. I'm, I, I haven't seen one this year. I have parsley, but no, no um, black swallowtails. I had milkweed in my garden for years, and I saw lots of monarchs uh, sipping on nectar here and there, but none of them ever laid their eggs on my milkweed, unfortunately. Okay, this is the fifth one I picked. This is the painted lady butterfly, and this is the most abundant butterfly in the world. It is on every continent except Australia and Antarctica. And the uh, males and females can only be told apart by uh, careful inspection. This is what the uh, dorsal side looks like. The ventral side is quite different. See this this hind wing, these eye spots, as they call them, are the identifying characteristic here. And uh, there are four of them. So, and this is the beauty caterpillar. These things feed preferentially on thistles, but they also will feed on soybean foliage, which makes them a bit of a pest in an agricultural area but they feed on all manner of thistles. And a thistle is another plant that it's not hard to find if you have a natural patch or a, a weedy patch. This is the egg. The eggs in, I was lucky to find these pictures. You'll notice that most of these slides have a, a photo credit from somebody. I found them on Bugnet, wherever I could look, find, anywhere where it said you can use them for non-commercial purposes. Uh, these um, have what they call eruptive migration, I-R-R-U-P-T-I-V, eruptive, which means that they, um, they don't aren't programmed to migrate like the uh, monarch is. They, if it gets too cold, then they will start trying to go where it's warmer. And if they don't get to a warm enough place, then they will uh, once who stay, you die off. And this is a very late chrysalis. And this one is almost about to hatch. And, um, and then the last one, this is a great spangled fritillary and it made the cut here today because this is a picture I took. I bought some heliotrope. I brought it home, I sat it on my patio, hadn't planted it in a pot or anything yet, and I went back out to do that, and here was this great spangled fritillary enjoying my heliotrope. Now these lay their eggs on violets, and it's a strange story. They, oh, oh, oh yeah, first, this is what the uh, ventral side looks like. And those prominent silvery white, spots those are considered identifying factors so what it will do it lays its eggs on violets or near them this is an egg these are just some and these are the uh um wild native violets that all always in your garden i mean i don't think i've ever had a garden that didn't have some violets inviting themselves in and what happens is this little egg will hatch. This is fairly late in the season and it crawls down into the leaf litter and it spends the winter there in a state of torpor or um, what, what you call hibernation, diapause, as they say, several words for this. And then in the spring, when the violets start to leaf out, then these little tiny caterpillars wake up and they feed on the violets. They, they never uh, destroy them all so that they're not, it's not a problem. This is what they look like. If they survive the fact that you've cleaned up the leaf litter, then this is what you might see. And it would be very low to the ground on, on the violets. And um, then they pupate and they have this, their early chrysalis is gorgeous. See this thing, this is so beautiful. And this is a later version. This one is about to hatch. This is an early version. So those are my, that's my hit parade of butterflies and their caterpillars that you might see 
in and around our area. And if you have any questions, make them easy. Hey, okay, well, thank you, Kelly. That was a very interesting talk. I learned so much that I can actually attract with some common plants like parsley, some butterflies to hatch in my garden. That's excellent. Um, so while we're waiting for questions, so please type them in the chat. Uh, I will have a few questions. Um, so one question would be, is it okay to trap the caterpillars um, and place them in a box, um, separate them from their natural environment um, and watch them to develop to a butterfly? As yeah, lots of people do that. Usually, you don't really separate them from their environment. You have to take their host plant with them. This is generally not considered a good idea. I didn't mention that these caterpillars are, have a lot of predators and uh, birds especially enjoy them, a lot mm -hmm. of them. And uh, so they don't all make it to um, butterflyhood at all. But generally, it's not considered a great idea to, uh, to raise them in captivity. And, and people do this with monarchs all the time. And the studies are starting to show that like this, a lot of the captively bred butterflies don't have the same uh, uh, urge to migrate as the uh, ones that are out there just doing their thing, surviving. A lot of, um, one place I read, a lot of the less fit will survive if they are protected. Uh, the expectation is that maybe 10% of the eggs that are laid and the caterpillars that hatch, maybe 10% will survive. Well, if somebody's out there collecting them all up, you might get 80% of them surviving and they will not necessarily be the fittest ones. Some mm -hmm. of them die off on their own, never mind being eaten by a bird. So eh, it's a hazy area. Okay. Anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, so I uh, have uh, another uh, question. Um, if, um, if I have a butterfly bush, uh, the, 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 the butterfly uh, uh, milkweed, um, and if I decide to divide the bush, uh, would the, the, the butterfly find uh, the new location or it's best to divide it at some specific time um well if, if you have as i said i had uh, milkweed in my garden and uh kept there for the monarch and it never used it uh, well i saw them nectaring on it perhaps but i never saw an egg on it. i never saw them lay an egg although i was very vigilant about that but if they have laid eggs on them if their caterpillar is feeding on the uh, milkweed you you should be able to see that people who uh, go out into the fields to find them they they inspect the milkweed and they find them quite easily so if you have milkweed and you see that it is host to some caterpillars i think i would just leave it alone until they're done and then i would divide it at another time no point in getting them all upset. Um, most butterflies feed on nectar flowers. Uh, one of the exceptions is the morning cloak, that first one that comes out when the, maybe snow's still on the ground. It tends to feed on tree sap because it's so early, there are no flowers uh, already in bloom there. So, um, but you'll see butterflies all over your milkweed maybe or your monarda or any of these flowers that have nectar and that's and the, um, that's what the butterflies need but then they they have a special instinct that tells them where the nettles are or the thistles are or the violets are and they lay their eggs near there these butterfly females are pretty smart i say oh, thank you thank you so there is a, a very interesting comment by tula this was the first year I have a significant amount of milkweed in my yard. And on the other day, I saw milkweed tussock moth caterpillar for the first time. It's quite spectacular. And if you like to see pictures, she actually is providing some links uh, that you can click on and um, you can go to the chat and you can see the link. I will do that after I 
That's great. And there is another comment from Mary Crawford. Uh, I noticed one of the black swallowtails, small black early stage caterpillars on my parsley this morning. Oh, yes. I didn't know what it was. And so now I'll be on the lookout for parsley to disappear. <laughs> yes. Now, uh, I won't uh, make the mistake. My, I had my parsley growing in an inhospitable environment in that it was like a once you moved off the parsley, you were in a sort of a concrete jungle. So I uh, hope that uh, that parsley is growing outside in a garden so that when that uh, 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 caterpillar is ready to move off and um, pupate somewhere, that it, it's not going to land on the concrete floor. Yeah. Um, so there is another uh, comment from Tula, which is very interesting, uh, what she says. So my milkweed is covered with aphids. I read somewhere that monarchs don't like to lay their eggs if there are aphids. I was planning to try to get rid of the aphids, but then the monarchs had arrived and I didn't want to accidentally get rid of the monarch eggs. Do you know if the aphids are actually harmful to hatching the monarch's caterpillars or if they won't eat the leaves because of the aphids? Well, that's something I'm going to have to look up. I don't know. Very uh, interesting. Yes. It is interesting. Uh, the, the monarch uh, female has uh, some, uh, somehow with their foot, scratches the surface of the... Uh, whatever plant it's visiting and decides based on the smell whether or not this is the right place to lay their eggs but they lay their eggs singly i i don't know but and the eggs are very small that's something i'm gonna have to look up so i don't know <laughs> yes very interesting to see and i i'm not so sure if it's a good idea to treat the plant because this may deter the monarchs from laying the eggs on the plant I think if you look carefully, you would be able to tell the difference between the eggs and the aphids. But the eggs are usually laid in one, like they're not in a bunch of eggs, which would make them easy to find. They're laid singly. So maybe hard to yeah. find. Yeah, and they're usually on the bottom of the leaf, right? Uh, it, the bottom top, that wherever uh, she decides to deposit them, that's where they are laid, as long as it's a uh, milkweed. Yeah, uh, and I will have uh, one last question. Um, and in the fall, what is the best strategy, how to leave the garden to help all the butterflies that are overwintering in the garden to give them a, a better start for the spring? Well, uh, certainly if, if you have any leaf litter near violets in a shady patch in your garden or whatever, don't clean it up because you would no doubt be cleaning up some of the great spangled fritillary tiny little caterpillars with that. Uh, the morning cloak, it tucks itself into the crevices and logs and any, it would, you would probably find, if you've seen them around, you would probably find them uh, snuggled up in uh, places like that. Generally speaking, it's a good idea to leave the garden a little bit natural in the fall, especially if you have been lucky enough to be visited by butterflies. There's quite a few that overwinter here, really, uh, either as uh, uh, hanging off the tree. I, I, I just love the idea of these little things hanging with their little silk hibernaculum hanging off the tree. Um, that you wouldn't hurt by cleaning up underneath the tree, but anyway. So I think that might be just the right place to stop. Kelly, that was an absolutely fabulous talk. And for um, audience members, if you have any other questions, just send them along to our uh, Master Gardeners helpline. And uh, next week, our talk will be some quick picker uppers for a tired garden. So please join us next week. Bye.